This video is sponsored by Blinkist. Use the link in the description below to get 25% off the premium membership price, plus seven days free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Plain Bagel. I'm your host, Richard Coffin. We've gone three weeks without a major banking collapse, so congratulations. Well done. But even though the dust has settled quite a bit in that space uh, since the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the takeover of Credit Suisse more recently, we obviously are not completely out of the woods. And you've probably seen one of these articles circulating, highlighting the massive unrealized losses that some of even the biggest US banks have uh, that could cause real trouble for them if they were to experience a similar situation to Silicon Valley Bank. But for today's video, I wanted to walk through some of the finances and stats that we have for these big banks to explain how they compare to Silicon Valley Bank and why for the largest banks in the US, while risks are elevated, it's still quite far from a Silicon Valley Bank situation. Now, I'll be focusing on the biggest four US banks, which are JP Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. And obviously, because these are all publicly traded stocks, please do not take this as a buy or sell recommendation around any of these companies. This really is just one puzzle piece of a, of a very <laughs> big picture. So without further ado, let's hop right into it, starting with the size of these banks relative to a Silicon Valley Bank, which you can see these banks are quite a bit larger. Their deposits range from 1.3 to 2.3 three trillion dollars roughly 10 times the size of silicon valley bank at the midpoint so obviously very large institutions and in fact they're all labeled as gsibs or global systemically important banks meaning that if any one of them were to fail it would have significant implications for the global financial system uh, so how does one go about assessing the liquidity risk of these institutions or their ability to meet deposits as needed. Well, one approach is to look at the company's level of high quality liquid assets. This is a standardized measure that's part of the Basel III framework. And the way it works is that it tiers assets based on their liquidity or how easy they are to sell without a discount. And for assets that are highly liquid like cash, obviously 100% of their value is included in this measure. But for the assets that are a bit less liquid, uh, they can actually have a haircut of up to 50% of their fair value when calculating this measure. So they already incorporate a discount to account for a possible fire sale in a stressed situation. So what level of high quality liquid assets do these different banks have? Uh, well, I'll pull them up on screen and you can see that roughly a quarter to up to 42% of the bank's deposits are backed by high quality liquid assets. Now that's encouraging considering that there is conservatism with the haircuts incorporated here and that these banks do have other assets that could be sold if needed. Uh, but there is also a second metric we can look at here for liquidity. Uh, that's also part of the Basel III standard, uh, which is the liquidity coverage ratio which takes the high quality liquid assets and divides it by the expected net withdrawals or, or outflows from a bank over a 30 day period of stressed market conditions. And this measure is required to stay above 100%, meaning that they can meet all the withdrawals within that 30 day period of, of stressed conditions. Uh, but in terms of what the measure sits at for these institutions, again, it, it's roughly around 120% across the board, except for JP Morgan, which has both 112% for the firm wide, but 151% specifically for its banking operation. And to add a bit more context around this figure, also throw up the percentage of deposits that is being assumed to be withdrawn over this 30 day period of stress conditions. And you can see it ranges from 15% on the low end to roughly 36% on the high end of total deposits. So again, at a high level, that's relatively encouraging that there's this line of defense, if you will, against a liquidity run. Uh, but how does this all compare to Silicon Valley Bank situation? Well, we don't necessarily know <laughs> because one problem that Silicon Valley Bank's collapse highlighted is that regional banks in the US are not required to disclose all the same information or meet all the same standards under Basel III. Silicon Valley Bank didn't disclose a standardized measure of high quality liquid assets, nor did it disclose an LCR ratio. And while I've seen conflicting estimates for what the company's LCR would look like under the framework, we just don't know because you need a bit of extra detail that's not inherently disclosed in the company's regulatory filings. But I might wonder, Richard, what happens if one of these banks experiences greater withdrawals than what they're preparing for with these figures or these situations. Well, in that case, it's worth considering the company's solvency. And one of the most widely looked at figures here for solvency is the company's CET1 ratio. The CET1 ratio refers to the company's common equity tier one capital divided by its risk weighted assets. CET1 capital refers to common equity, so shareholder money, as well as retained earnings or, or money the company has made and, and kept on hand that would be the first line of defense against losses. So if the bank were to lose money, this is more or less what would be funding those losses 
so the bank can continue operating. Now the denominator, risk-weighted assets, refers to the company's assets and they are weighted based on their, their risk, uh, meaning that things like uh, cash and treasuries have a very low, if not 0% weighting. And the idea is to compare how much sort of loss absorbing first line of defense capital there is relative to this bucket of, of risky assets, more or less. And when looking at the big four banks, all their ratios meet their minimums and sit above 10%. And there is other capital that can help absorb losses as well. Uh, but most people focus on CET1 given that it's the first line of defense and makes up the majority of that available capital. Now, if you were to look at Silicon Valley Bank's reported CET1 ratio, you would see it's actually on the higher end of this peer group at roughly 12%. Uh, but a key caveat here is that again, because regional banks are not held to the same standard as the larger companies and, and GSIBs, there are actually some losses that are excluded from calculating this ratio. Specifically, the company chose to opt out of a certain standard that quote, allows it to exclude from capital AOCI or accumulated other comprehensive income related to available for sale debt and equity securities, cash flow hedges, defined benefit post retirement plans and held to maturity securities. And if you reverse that adjustment, you can see that the CET1 ratio would have actually been 10.4%. Now here's the thing, that's still not that, that different from the peer group here. And it's not really these unrealized losses that people are worried about, but rather the unrealized losses for held to maturity securities, which doesn't reflect in any of the CET1 ratios and is much, much larger. Within a bank's balance sheet, investments or securities can have one of three designations based on what their intent is or why the bank is holding them. Uh, there is trading securities, which uh, the bank holds for the purpose of trading, uh, and that reports to net income. There is available for sale, meaning that obviously the bank is interested in selling these assets. And those uh, unrealized gains and losses, even though they aren't uh, realized, they do flow through to the AOCI. And then there is held to maturity, which are debt securities that the bank obviously intends to hold until maturity. Now, the problem is that held to maturity assets are recorded on the balance sheet at amortized cost, which just means that they recorded at the cost at which they were purchased with an adjustment for amortization. Won't get into that, but they don't reflect the market value of the bond, uh, which means that if they were forced to sell this held maturity portfolio, they could experience a gain or loss that wasn't otherwise reflected. It would impair or impact the CET1 ratio. And that's what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. They had unrealized losses on their held maturity portfolio of $15.2 billion, which at the firm level was actually more than their CET1 capital. Which brings us to the big question of the video, which is where do the big banks sit in terms of their unrealized losses for held to maturity assets. Well, here are the dollar amounts for those losses. Every bank does have losses on their held to maturity portfolio. The Bank of America has by far the largest amount at over 100 billion US dollars and also has the largest percentage drop in the value of these assets at minus 17%. And here are the losses relative to CET1 capital. Not quite as bad as Silicon Valley Bank, but again, with Bank of America, you have it representing 60% of its CET1 capital. As for why the losses are biggest for Bank of America, it really has to do with the maturity profile of its holdings. As you may know, the longer the term to maturity for a debt security, the higher its price sensitivity to rising interest rates. And the vast majority of Bank of America's held maturity assets are in debt securities due in 10 or more years, uh, compared to JP Morgan, for example, which is only at around 42% in 10 or more years. This is also why Silicon Valley Bank's losses were so large for what's generally seen as a stable investment class uh, because it had 94.2% of its assets in 10 plus year maturities. And that's why a lot of people are worried about these larger US banks. It's not that it's as bad of a situation as Silicon Valley Bank in terms of management, uh, but they do have a large percentage of their portfolio in these longer maturity assets uh, that are yielding only around 2% in most cases that will continue yielding for the next 10 years and can't really be sold into the market lest these companies absorb a massive loss. But with all that, there are some additional points I do wanna to raise to give more perspective on these figures. It's not to say that there isn't risk here, but you know, to say that what happened with Silicon Valley Bank will happen to one of these big banks is, is really uh, unreasonable with what we currently see. With the first point being that Silicon Valley Bank was a really poorly managed bank from a risk perspective. In addition to having practically all their money in long-term maturities, the company also operated without a chief risk officer for eight months, meaning they had no person in charge of, of managing the bank's risk. 
And one of the ways you can really see how this bank wasn't managing its risk exposures is with its derivatives. Banks will enter things like interest rate swaps, options and futures at times to offset their interest rate risk in a lot of circumstances. Uh, which to really simplify the explanation, think of it as like they have their bonds over here, which will fall in value if interest rates rise. So they enter a derivative that will increase in value when interest rates rise to try and offset that. Now, Silicon Valley Bank had a total notional amount for its derivative portfolio of $5.65 billion relative to its 200 or so billion dollars in assets of which only 550 million were designated as hedges. In other words, the notional value for these contracts, which is really just a reference point, it's not on par with market value, uh, but notional value for these derivatives represented roughly 2.7% of total assets, and the hedging notional value was only 0.3% relative to total assets. This compares to Bank of America, which has a derivative notional value amount for interest rate specific derivatives of 24.3 trillion US dollars. Eight times its total asset balance. Now they don't disclose how many of these derivatives are meant for hedging purposes, but every large US bank had notional values for their interest rate specific derivatives in the tens of trillions of dollars. And for Citigroup and Wells Fargo, who do disclose how much of these derivatives are for hedging, the notional value represented 11 and 14% of their total assets respectively, compared again to 0.2% that Silicon Valley Bank did. Basically, hedging was non-existent at Silicon Valley Bank. The second thing to consider is that the unrealized losses on the held maturity portfolio are really only an issue in this circumstance if the financial institutions experience a bank run. The nature of held maturity assets is that, you know, surprise, the, the banks want to hold them until they mature. And if they are able to do so, they don't actually experience a loss because they get the face value of that bond back. And that's why held maturity assets do get that different accounting treatment. It's not to say that that can't be abused, uh, but that is why there are different rules for held maturity assets. And the risk of a bank run in America's largest four banks is much less than it was for Silicon Valley Bank. The banks are much larger, meaning that it would require a significant portion of the population to go and withdraw their money from these institutions. They are much more diversified. The big thing with Silicon Valley Bank was that it catered to a very particular crowd, the, the venture capital uh, startup space in California. So when there are difficulties and contagion in that space, it had a very acute impact on Silicon Valley Bank. These banks also have a lot more of their deposits insured under FDIC coverage. Uh, again, another news item around Silicon Valley Bank was that 95.5% of their deposits were uninsured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which covers deposits up to $250,000. Citigroup has the next largest amount of uninsured deposits at roughly 85%. But for the other banks, a large percentage, if not the majority of deposits are insured by FDIC, with Bank of America actually having one of the lowest uninsured percentages at 37.3%. Now, I know there's noise around infinite coverage and, and you know the implications and all that. That's not really in the scope of this video. The, the point is that you know in traditional settings, these banks have a lot more insurance for their deposits than Silicon Valley Bank. Now, third thing I wanna highlight, we did have the Federal Reserve extend that lending program, which helps address the more acute pressures around a bank run and decreases that risk. Uh, more specifically, the Federal Reserve is now allowing banks to borrow from it for up to a year using the par value of its assets, of their assets as collateral. Meaning that if these banks were to experience a, a rapid increase in, in withdrawals, rather than selling their bonds at a loss, they can simply borrow against them at the par value that doesn't recognize that unrealized loss on the value of those assets. Now, the fourth point I wanna highlight here is that banks actually benefit from rising interest rates. The volatility around interest rates can really mess up profitability and impact margins in the short term. But as rates rise over the long term, as markets adjust, banks tend to become more profitable. In fact, all the banks we looked at disclose how much they think their profits will increase should we see a parallel shift in interest rates. In other words, both short-term and longer-term interest rates rise by 100 basis points. And you can see that for all the banks except for JP Morgan, the impact is positive. So obviously a lot of things to consider when looking at the situation. Yes, we do have this massive unrealized loss on a lot of these assets, but you know, again, these banks are planning to hold those assets until maturity. And so long as there isn't an acute pressure that forces them to sell these assets, that could be the case where they don't actually experience one of these losses. These losses don't crystallize or materialize for these banks. But I do wanna be balanced on both ends here. And I'll mention that for one, uh, even though the risk of a bank run is much 
less severe for these larger institutions. If you assume that a bank run will happen, they can destroy even the healthiest of financial institutions. There is a reason that Silicon Valley Bank did fail when interest rates rose. And there, it's not likely that JP Morgan, for example, would see an 80% withdrawal rate on its deposits, given its sheer size and importance to the US economy. But the biggest risks here really are around trust. And if a financial institution were to lose its trust with, with its depositors, then it could very much fail, even if it is run the most conservatively out of the, the batch. The second thing is that obviously we only know what we know and what banks are required and, and what they let us know. And it tends to be that in situations like this is when blemishes really come to the surface, such as with Silicon Valley Bank, which you know some of these red flags were there, but most people weren't picking up on them until we saw the concerns and, and you know the collapse of, of that institution. And the third thing I'll highlight is that the risk is still much more active with the regional banks. I wanted to focus on the, the large banks because that's what a lot of these articles are, are focusing on, that massive unrealized loss on, on held to maturity assets. Uh, but it is worth considering that there is still an elevated risk around bank runs for regional institutions. With higher yielding alternatives to bank accounts and concerns that a smaller regional bank may not be deemed too big to fail to warrant intervention, these regional banks do still face pressure from heightened withdrawals. But once again, I'll highlight that we have seen interventions to help stem that. Um, we'll have to wait and see what happens. So that's where we stand today. And I hope this helped to provide some perspective on things. Before I sign off, if you wanna learn more about derivatives and how they've played a role in past financial crises or past scandals even, I highly recommend you check out the Spider Network on Blinkist, which is today's sponsor. The Spider Network by David and Rich tells the story of Tom Hayes, who is one of the traders arrested for manipulating the LIBOR rate, an important interest rate benchmark for UBS. Yes, that UBS. <laughs> and on Blinkist, you can get the key insights for this book and many, many other nonfiction titles in typically under 15 minutes by either reading or listening to it. It's an awesome phone app I use all the time to multitask when I'm doing chores or whatever have you. This year, I'm wanting to become a better writer and learn more about the history of, of the stock market, which led me to this one. And one of the interesting blinks from this story was that Tom Hayes was a scapegoat for a corrupt and broken banking system, which goes to show why oversight and controls in the banking sector really are a must. They have a bunch of other categories on there as well, not just money and investments titles. And best of all, their Blinkist Connect feature lets you share a premium membership between two different accounts, meaning you essentially get a two for one deal. It's a great app, I highly recommend it. And if you'd like to try it out for yourself, you can use the link in the description below to get 25% off the premium membership price, plus one week for free with Blinkist Connect giving two memberships for the price of one. So thank you Blinkist and thank you guys for joining me today. I hope this helped to explain the situation and hopefully ease the, the worst of, of concerns. Again, this is a developing story. This is an active situation, but when it comes to the largest U.S. banks, the risk just isn't quite what it was like with Silicon Valley Bank. And you really do need to keep that in mind when you see people talking about the end of the financial system as we know it. That's a little unfounded, which hopefully this, this helped to show. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, found it helpful, please do make sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. It does help the channel tremendously. And let me know your thoughts in the comments down below, whether this has improved your perspective on things or made it worse. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what it's done uh, unintentionally. Uh, but thank you for joining me today. And until next time, be safe out there.